ba 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 ba. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, in the name of the resurrected Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, I give you praise and I give you glory. Lord, I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters that are going to be joining me right now, God. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you for uh, Wesley, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that God let your will be done, oh Lord, in their lives, God, as they join in, Lord, as we talk about why we pray and how to pray effectively today, God, in Jesus' name, Lord. I just want to thank you for Brother Richard Siwale, Lord, uh, in Jesus' name, and many others that are coming in to join in today's broadcast. Lord, I thank you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with thanksgiving in my heart, as everybody agrees with me by saying amen. And God bless you, Camellia. Glad you. God bless you for joining in, and many others that are coming in. And please feel free to call your friends and tell them that Glory TV is on right now. Today we're going to be talking about prayer, uh, why we pray, and uh, how to pray effectively. If you have any questions, please feel free. You can call that screen. Uh, you can call that number on that screen there, and uh, it's going to be ready here. And I'll be able to answer your questions, or maybe if you have a comment that you want to make, please feel free to do so. It's going to be a blessing for you today because we are talking about effective prayer and how we can pray and i pray that you be blessed today so let's get started right now so we are talking about prayer so when it comes to prayer i think uh, the best scripture that we're going to use today in fact we're going to do like a verse by verse or an exegesis of uh, the book of matthew chapter 6 and we're going to be starting from there and then we'll be talking about that and see how you're going to be blessed hallelujah glory be to god actually the greek word for prayer uh, it's the word prosukumai, meaning uh, face to face or addressed to God. So you know exactly. So when we talk about prayer, Sister Sandra, nice to see you. God bless you there. We're talking about why pray and how to pray effectively. God bless you. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to just tag me up here and uh, you're going to be blessed. I think the phone wasn't connected in. I just got to put it in, in there here. So God bless you. And uh, you can call that number, Sister Wendy, nice to see you also there. May God bless you guys. You are wonderful people. We love you so much. God bless you, every one of you here. Okay, great. So we all sit. If you have any question as we talk about prayer, feel free to call. And as we call, I'll be able to answer. And if there is anybody who has a prayer request later on, we can do that. And we're going to be praying. God bless you. Okay, so let's get started now. So I just say that uh, prosukomai, that's the Greek word for prayer, which means face to face or addressed to God. Now, so prayer really is addressing God. Of course, we know we understand that prayer is not only me talking, 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 talking all the time. It's you talk to God and God talks to you. Now we're going to look at the dynamics of prayer as we go on. Please stick around with me and you'll be blessed today. So our our chapter that we're going to be using, we're going to go from to the book of Matthew chapter 5, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6 actually, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be starting from verse 5 up to 14, up to the end. And then we could see the nuggets in that there, there's quite a number of things that are going to bless your heart today. So stick around, please call somebody and tell them that Glory TV is on again today. We're talking about why pray and effective way to pray. So let's get started here. The Bible declares, okay, uh, from verse 5, and it, the Bible says, I'll be using my paraphrased version here. The Bible says, it says, and when thou prayest, okay, when thou prayest. Now, as we start to read there, I'm just going to say something here. When, one time when Jesus was with his disciples, the disciples of Jesus saw something very peculiar about Jesus. They saw something very unique. Every time when they're walking around, they'll see Jesus withdraws and he goes by himself somewhere on top of the mountain. He goes somewhere in the mountains by himself. And when the scene comes back, when he comes back, then they see him perform the supernatural. They begin to see manifestation of the presence of God upon Jesus. They begin to see him raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and uh, do kinds of miracles and cast out devils. So they were really wondering. So it seems like when he goes somewhere by himself, when he comes back, all these things begin to happen. Now, when they came to him, they did not ask him and says, Master, 
teach us how to perform miracles, but they asked him something very special. They said, Master, teach us how to pray, because they understood that what brought the supernatural was the prayer. When the prayer, when he prayed, then these things happened. So then they asked him, says, Master, teach us how to pray. So they were really, really smart because they knew the secret of Jesus. Every time he went by himself on the side, when he came back, the supernatural took place. Now in verse 5, so let's get started on that one there. And it says, and when the thou prayest, okay? And when thou prayest, thou shall not be as the hypocrites are. What does that mean then? Now, let's look at the word when in Matthew chapter uh, 6, starting from verse 5, the Bible says, when you pray. Now, there's some people there, you're a believer, you're born again, Holy Ghost, few t- tongue talking, or tap recorder, I like to say, maybe you're, you're a Christian, you accepted Christ as your own personal Savior, you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you're a born again Christian. So the thing is, a lot of Christians, they say, you know what? I don't think I have a gift of prayer, so I don't have to pray so much because I'm not going to be an intercessor. By the way, I'm going to bust your bubble today. Did you know that every child of God is supposed to be a praying person? Because here, if you look at Matthew there, Matthew chapter 6, starting from verse 5, it says, And when, it doesn't say if, it says, and when, you pray. So now, if I understand, I'm not an English teacher, but if my English really served me so well, what I understand by the word when, if I say to you that when I come to you, when I come, so the thing is, what I'm trying to say, I'm going to come. The question is not if I'm going to come or not come. The question is when am I going to come? Because I say when I come. So when Jesus was saying, when you pray, there's no question to say whether you should pray or not. The thing is, you're going to have to find the time to pray. That means every child of God is supposed to be a praying person. So it says, when you pray, so you have to find time. So when you pray, not if you pray, so you don't have an option. If there was an option, then the word there will be used, if you pray. That means you have an option whether to pray or not to pray. Okay, so when you pray, the word of God declares, it says, you shall not be like the hypocrites are. Why? Because hypocrites, they love to be seen by men. They did things in order to be seen by men. They did things, they practice, they preach, but they don't practice what they teach. You know, they talk the talk, they don't walk the talk. God wants us to walk the talk, and we talk the talk, we walk the talk. We talk the talk, walk the talk. So not just walk, uh, not just talk the talk without walking the talk. He wants us to walk the talk. In other words, to practice what we teach. If we say love, then we have to love ourselves. So hypocrites are people that pretend. They show you something else, but they're actually like some kind of imposters that don't really show exactly. So Jesus was saying, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites are. For they love to be seen by men. When they prayed, the hypocrites, they prayed in order to be seen by men. By the way, did you know that prayer is not for you to be seen by men? Because these hypocrites, they love to stand in the synagogue, in the corners of the synagogues, raising up their hands and praying so that everybody can see them. They walk like uh, the, they're the most holiest people, and everybody looked up to them. They said, oh, if you want to talk about God, if you want to see the move of God, these are the people that have it. So everything that they were doing was geared specifically to please people. You've been called out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, not to please people, but to please God. Remember that. Always remember, everything you do, your focus should be God, not people. Uh, over the years, you know, as a, as a young man, I think I've learned quite a number of, uh, a lot of things. I remember most of the time that when it came to prayer, we prayed specifically to please the people that were around us. In fact, if uh, I was asked to pray, I'll try and make it in such a way that when I'm talking, it's going to have correct verbiage and how I'm going to speak and how it's going to sound to the people. And by the time I said, Amen, everybody will look at me and says, Man, God, you can pray. Now, it was all baloney. It was all specifically for people, not for God. Remember, when you pray, you're not praying to people, you're praying to God. So you have to pray to please God in everything that you do. Don't be like the hypocrites for love to be seen standing in the streets. And because of that, when people come to you, says, man, you can pray. The Bible says you've already received your reward when people are saying, 
saying that to you. So you don't pray to be seen by men. Now, when we do things in order to be seen by men, I want to say a couple of things here. People listen, people of God listen. A lot of things that we do, they're so mundane. We don't even focus on God. We focus on man and what people, how we appear to people, how it looks like to people, how we please people. Listen to this. For those of you that are there, of course, I'm in the two, you know, where God's not, when it comes to the end of the world, at the end day, at the day of judgment, God's not going to ask you what kind of a car you were driving. God's going to ask you how many people you gave a ride. That's what it's going to be like, you know, how many people you gave a ride or how many people you gave transportation. And God's not going to ask you, you know, how big or what's the footage of your house, like the square footage, how big it was. God's going to ask you how many people did you welcome in your house? So you see, if you do things to please people, if you do things in order to be seen by people, you are staping on the the wrong ground so you're gonna to have to turn that could go totally different so God's not gonna ask you about that and remember God's not gonna ask you about the clothes that you wear maybe it's Gucci or Versace or whatever or this brand name it's not gonna ask you how big your closet is it's not gonna ask you how many clothes you have in the closet or how good they are it's gonna ask you how many people did you help so remember don't do mundane things. Only things that you do for eternity really matters. We're going to come back to prayer. I thought I should just say that a little bit there. And again, remember that God's not going to ask you, you know, how high or how big your salary was. Because sometimes people, you know, become so braggadocious because they make a lot of money and stuff like that. And then it's something that they become, uh, uh, they start to brag about. And then, you know, but God's not going to ask you, how much did you make? God's going to ask you, what did you compromise in order to obtain what you hired? Remember that. So keep this. What you do for eternity will last for eternity. Everything you do is for eternity. Now, okay, I thought I should say that. Anyway, it was just the side Karen that just came in, and I thought I should just kind of say to you. Now, in verse 6, I mean in verse, uh, verse uh, 6, actually, you know, we just read verse 5. It's 5, it says, but when you pray, again, then we see something again. If you go, if you're following in your Bible right now, you go back to the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. We read that now, verse 6. In verse 6, again, the Bible just says the same thing. It says, but when, again, when, 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 two times now we sin, but when you pray. When thou, the King James will say thou, which means you. But when thou prayest, in other words, it says, enter into the closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father, which sees in secret. And the Heavenly Father, which sees in secret, will reward you. Now, now I heard somebody says, how can I pray? Because I don't have a closet. The Bible says you're going to have to enter into the closet in order to pray. No, it doesn't mean that. What it really means it simply means that find a place, okay? Now, let's go back to when, then I'm going to talk about this. There again, it says when, right? When, when, remember two times we see when, when. So no option again, it's not if, it's when. So you're going to have to find the time when you're going to do this. Now there it says, enter into the closet. Now I've heard somebody says, you know, I have no closet, so I can't pray because the Bible says enter into the closet. What does that, what does that mean really? Well, it doesn't simply mean that you enter into the closet. You know, I remember I lived in a house where we didn't have a closet at one time. So then I would say, I, I, I'm not going to pray because we don't have a closet. No, it doesn't mean that. What it really means, it means go in a place where it's secluded, in seclusion. In other words, where there's no distractions. Have you ever wondered why we close our eyes when we pray? Actually, this is going to bust your bubble. When we close our eyes when we pray, it's not even in the Bible. The reason why we do that is so that we're not distracted by people, so that we don't have distractions to avoid distractions. That's why we close our eyes. All right? That's what the word, uh, uh, the, in the word there, when you see that, we close our eyes so that we are not distracted. But many times, if you're in churches, you know, that's the time when you see people doing all kinds of stuff when you 
are praying you know when you are praying that's when some people reach out into their handbags and they start to try and put the mascara and they try to correct the foundation and all that kind of stuff and the lipstick but that's, that's the wrong time to do that when you're praying avoid all kinds of distraction it says shut the door and close yourself for the heavenly father who sees in secret will reward you openly that means everything that you do in secret you know it's, it's known by the Father. People might not know about it, but the Heavenly Father sees it. You cry alone. You're in the closet alone. You're praying. You know, whatever you're, when we talk about the closet, it's a place that you can find anywhere. It doesn't matter where. Many years ago, I remember when I used to be in Bible college in Africa, I had uh, different places. Uh, place We have a little dog in the studio, so it's kind of making noise a little bit here. I hope you don't mind. So, and uh, so we had different people that had different closets, you know, different places to pray. I remember some of my friends were playing, praying in a washroom somewhere. I used to take a walk uh, in the, along, the, along the streets in the woods and I'll be going there to pray. And others were praying on top of the roof, others everywhere, different places. But the, whatever you do, find a place where you can be in seclusion, you and God, where you can be talking to God. Find a place. It could be in your car. It could be in your bedroom. It could be maybe you take a morning walk or whatever, or afternoon walk. But find a place where you can be alone with God, to talk to God, to commune with God. When you talk to God, God will be talking to you. Many of us, we are so busy doing everything that we can. By the time we get back to sleep, we are so tired that we can't even pray. By the time we start to pray, you know, by the time we try to say amen, we're already fast asleep. Then we get up later, maybe two hours later, and then we say amen. No, that kind of prayer. Please give time to God. Find time when you can start to communicate with God, when you can pray. All right? Find a secluded place where there's no distractions that you can pray. And then in verse 7, the Bible says, it says, but when, again, look at this now. We see that three times, all right? The first time in verse 5, it says when, and verse 6, it says when, and verse 7, it says when you pray, use not. Again, remember, it does not so if you pray. So you have no option but to communicate with God. We understand that prayer is a communicating with God. You talk to God and God talks to you. But many, many of us, we use prayer as a way of just talking, 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 talking. And by the time God wants to talk to us, we say amen and we're ready to leave. But have a time where you can commune with God. You know, learn to talk. How do you like it if you were my buddy and we were taking a walk? Maybe we're taking a drive from here. Maybe we're going to Calgary or something. But I'm the one talking, talking all the time, talking, not giving a chance for you to respond to what I'm saying. You know, you're not going to like that. So you want to talk. It's the same way with God. When we come to prayer, we can talk to God and God will talk back to us. But we need to give him the time there according to what the word of God says. You know, we need to give the time to God so God can communicate to us. We have to learn to listen. Many of us, we talk more, but we don't listen. Now, have you ever wondered why you have one mouth and not two, but two ears? That means you talk less, you listen more. We need to learn that, okay? We need to learn that. Now, in verse 7, it says, but when you pray, use not then reputations, meaning don't just uh, uh, bubble things. So does it mean then we cannot pray the same thing over and over again? Uh, is God forbidding us not to repeat ourselves? No. If you look at Jesus himself, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he repeated himself. So God is not forbidding us to repeat ourselves. What is forbidding is forbidding us to use vain reputation. What is vain reputation? It's this stuff that you're just talking. You don't even mean it. You just say things. For example, yeah, people use the Lord's Prayer. They call it the Lord's Prayer. You know, they use that. For example, if they're going to pray that, they just go, Our oh, Father who art in heaven, I will be the name, the kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is. And then they just bubble it. And then afterward, then they say, Amen. And then they go to sleep. Some of them, they take books that were written maybe 1948. Uh, their prayers there, so they just recite them, and they just say them, they just say them. You don't just say it. You mean what you say. 
and say what you mean. When it comes to prayer, it's like you're pouring out your heart to God. You're standing. You know, think of a friend sitting together with you. For example, if there was somebody sitting next to me here, we'll be having a conversation. So we'll be talking about what I'm going through. Oh, my friend, this is this and this. So you are talking to God. You are talking. You're having a conversation with God. It's coming from deep down your heart. It's the things that are concerning you and things that are hurting you and you're talking, you're giving him praise, you're giving him glory, but it's coming from deep down your heart. It's not something that you've recited. It's not something that you've heard from somebody else. Then you're just trying to repeat it to God. That's the wrong way of prayer. So God does not forbid us to repeat ourselves. He forbids us to just say things without meaning what we say. And then there it says, you know, uh, many of us, we think that uh, because we have so much words to say, we think by saying a lot of things and God's going to hear us. Sometimes what we say is totally meaningless. You know, some stuff, if you look at yourself, I've looked at myself many times when I pray. If I prayed, most of the time I found that I was repeating myself and the things I was praying, it's like I was just talking stuff, talking stuff. But if you can let prayer come be birthed in your spirit and from there you begin to communicate to God and speaking to God, don't think that by much speaking then God's going to hear you. There's two kinds of people, should I say maybe three, when it comes to prayer. That those who have a lot to say and they keep saying, saying, saying things, by the time they finish, they feel better because they kind of like they've emptied up themselves with everything that they were saying, what they were feeling inside. They've just bubbled it out without even necessarily meaning they were just speaking. And then there's those people who have so much to say that they cannot say everything. The only thing that happens is that tears becomes their language. And all you see is just tears going down because they have so much. It's like Hannah in the Bible. Remember when she, she was praying for Samuel that time when she was, uh, she didn't have a baby and she was believing God. And, you know, uh, the, the man there, I think it was Eli, he just even made a mistake. He says, you must be drunk. But he didn't know that it was, she was traveling in prayer. She was praying because I, her heart was so heavy and it was coming from her heart. And she's just kind of like speaking, but yet the mouth is moving. But no words are coming out because it was so deep inside her. So there are those people in the world in today that they have so much to say they just bubble bubble things and then there are those who have so much to say they can't say everything they just cry before god because their heart is so heavy and it's so overwhelmed with things that are coming out there and then there are those that just yeah they're just there you know it's they they stand before god they just they think like God is like Santa Claus. They just give him prayer requests, prayer requests. That's all they do. They never come to thank God. They never come to praise his name. They never come to just appreciate what God is doing. If you get to the place where you can start to thank God. Remember when Jesus healed the 10 lepers, only one came back to say thank you. And according to what the word of God declares, that the one who came back to Jesus to say thank you, that one was made whole. In other words, he was totally healed. So I'm trying to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it's not just much speaking. It's what is coming out from your heart. Now, talking about much speaking here, it, I, I even think sometimes, you know, we kind of think the way we phrase things, we think then we impress God. May I say to you with all respect that sometimes we think by using certain verbiage, we think we can impress God. May I say that you cannot impress God by using bombastic words because God is the creator of words. So if you try to use those things, you're not impressed. God is not impressed that with God, with words. You know, the only thing that will impress God is your heart. When it's coming from deep down your heart and you've dedicated yourself, you've totally surrendered your heart to God. That is the heart that God is looking for. It's not those uh, correct verbiage and, uh, you know, the way you slay the words, the way you pronounce them, the way you said, you know, over the years we've been that. I remember many years ago, 
as young guys there, you know, we'll pray. And if it didn't sound American, that wasn't good prayer because prayer had to sound like you're speaking in an American English. Then that was anointed, which was all wrong because you're not there to impress God. God is not impressed by words. He's a creator of words. God is impressed with your heart. When your heart is pure, when you totally surrender to him, only then you can bring glory to God. So it's not words. And talking about words also, sometimes the way we pray, um, prayer is supposed to be specific, not, you know, beating about the bush. We'll be coming to that in just a second. So remember that about much speaking. Do not be like the hypocrites because they think by repeating themselves, by saying things, just bubbling them, they think God's going to hear them. But that's a wrong way of prayer. And then in verse uh, 8, the Bible says, it says, Be ye not therefore like unto them. For your heavenly Father knoweth what you need. Now, in fact, when we put the title there, we said, why pray? Now, here's a question. Why should I pray when God knows already what I'm praying for? When God knows exactly what I need, why should I pray? Well, and I know that, yes, you're asking that, and many people are asking that. So why should I pray when God knows? We understand, actually, when I was talking about the immutability of God, we talked about that God knows the past, the present, and the future, and God knows everything. You know, God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. There's nothing that happens to you that God does not know about, and everything God knows. So then why should I pray when God knows everything that I need? Well, the reason why you pray because you're acknowledging his supremacy in your circumstances and you are declaring his glory. You're saying, God, I cannot help myself. God, I'm crying to you. You're acknowledging his supremacy over your circumstances and that's why we pray. Not that God doesn't know. He knows exactly, but you're communing the other ways because we're having fellowship with God. We are talking with God. It's a way of communing to God. And as you're communing with God, the more you pray. I'll say something very profound here. You know, we, when we pray, when we talk to God, the more we seek God, not that God is lost, God is there. Sometimes I like to say that God is like he's hiding so that you can find him. In trying to find him, you lose yourself. When you lose yourself, the flesh dies. Therefore, your spirit becomes alive. You become so alive in God because now the flesh dies. When you come to the place where your flesh begins to die so much that what is known as dying to self, then your spirit man becomes alive. Then you begin to have victories in your life. You can conquer the enemy at any time. When you begin to pray, things begin to happen. Why? Because it's no longer you that leaves, but the spirit of God inside you that is leaving. And according to what the Word of God declares in the book of Romans, that the Spirit himself, he knows what the mind of God is, so therefore he prays through us. It's, it's a kind of prayer when you come, you totally dedicate yourself, you totally surrender to God, then things begin to happen. So the more you seek him, you know, you acknowledge his supremacy over your circumstances and whatever is happening, you commune with him, you're declaring his glory among the uh, in your insurmountable circumstances and in your situation in everything that you're going through you're declaring god and therefore you're having fellowship at the same time in so doing something great is happening to you change is happening to you so that's why we pray even though god knows exactly what we're praying for now when the disciples came to jesus he was saying to them this is when you pray pray in this manner now, does it mean that if we are going to sleep, then we just, I, I've seen over the years that there are certain people that if it comes to prayer, they just repeat the Lord's prayer and that's it. No, Jesus was saying, if you look at verse 9, it says, after this manna, after this manna, pray therefore. In other words, so the manna, he was trying to say, okay, your prayers, when you pray, your prayers have to have this in them. Now, let's look at some of those little nuggets that we're going to be talking about, the dynamics. So this is how what your prayer should consist of when you're praying, because uh, uh, that's what he says, okay? So after this manna, pray therefore, and then it says, our Father, okay? which art in heaven. Now, the first thing that we see there, you cannot call God Father if you don't have a relationship with God. So the first thing that we see there, that before you even start praying, you have to have a relationship because everything in Christianity or in Christendom, in 
you as a child of God and communicating to God, it's based upon your relationship. Relationship, relationship. If you have a weak relationship, a lot of things won't be happening. Your relationship, you know, is your overflow of the anointing or of your answer prayer. So you have to have a relationship. If you don't have a relationship by the end of the broadcast, I'll give you an opportunity where you can accept Christ as your own personal Savior. Once you develop that relationship, then you can start to follow him and things will start to happen in your life. So number one, there it says, our father. You cannot call him our father if there's no relationship. So first thing, have a relationship with God. And that relationship has to be sustained. Every day you have to work on that relationship. And then it says, how Lord be your name. What does that mean? To hallow God's name. If you look at the Hebrew names of God there, Jehovah Shama, the God who is at hand, Jehovah excuse me, Jehovah Nisi, you know, the God who fights, who's our banner, Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth us, Jehovah Sabbath, you know, Jehovah Mikadesh, our sanctifier, Jehovah Ra, our shepherd, all those Hebrew names. So when we are hallowing his name, we are sanctifying his name in our hearts. We believe that God, he is who he says he is. So you have number one, a relationship. And then secondly, you believe that God, he is who he says he is by hallowing, by hallowing hallowing his name by hallowing his name. So how you hallow God's name? By believing who he really is and what he says he is, and you believe that, then you're hallowing his name. In other words, you're like uh, sanctifying his name in your heart because you trust in him, you believe in him, you know that God is who he says he is. Now in verse 10 that the Bible says, you know, thine kingdom come all right so these are sh things that jesus was telling them your prayer first of all you have to have a relationship and secondly you have to hallow god's name in your heart in order you you just don't just pray because you want to pray you pray because you believe what you pray and many of us don't even believe what we pray i'll give you an example many years ago actually in the book of acts you see that uh, when paul was at point when uh, peter actually when he was in prison something very peculiar happened so there was a prayer meeting. They were praying for him to be released in prison. And they kept on praying, 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 praying. I think he was supposed to be killed the following morning. But they were praying for him. And as they were praying for him, a young lady ran from uh, the outs, ran, came knocking at the door to them, telling them, actually, you know what? The guy we are praying for is outside at the gate. He's knocking. He wants to come in. They said, no, 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 no. As far as we know, that's the ghost of Peter because Peter is dead, but they were praying. So they didn't even believe that the man they were praying for would be released. Many of us, even when we pray, we don't even believe that what we're praying for is going to happen. That's why when it happens, then we are surprised because we didn't even believe. Remember, believe. When you pray, believe. Relationship, believe by hallowing God's name in your heart. And then in verse 10 there, thy kingdom come. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God ruling. In other words, your kingdom come. Let God be the one reigning in my soul, in my spirit, in my life. Let him be the one reigning. So as it is in heaven, so should be here on earth. But God reigning, God reigning. Now, when God is reigning, where God is reigning, it means everything is governed by the word of God. So your prayers are supposed to be governed by the Word of God. Your life is supposed to be governed by the Word of God. Everything you do is supposed to be governing by the Word of God. Now, let me try to put an example there. When I'm talking about being governed by the Word of God, for example, you know that some vehicles that you can drive, you know, especially company vehicles, what they do, they put a governor on it. So that means no matter how much you staple on the gas there, on the uh, accelerator, it can only go up to 90. You can push that pedal all the way down. That thing's not going to go 120 or 130. It's just going to be 90 no matter how you staple on it. Why? Because they put a governor in that car. It governs the speed. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that uh, your life, everything you do should be governed by the word of God. God. The word of God should be the governing authority in everything that you do. That word should govern. 
no matter everything you're doing, the word should be the one governing there. So let your word, let, let your life be governed by the word of God. All right. And then there in uh, verse uh, that was 10, thy kingdom come, which means, of course, God luring in our lives and everything. And then in verse uh, 11, there, give us this day. I like this. It says, give us this day. Now, when you pray, you don't just pray because you pray. You have to be specific. If you're aiming at nothing, you're surely you're going to hit it. All right. If you don't know where you're going, whenever you reach anywhere, you've reached where you're going because you don't know where you're going. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that you have to be specific when you pray. When you pray, pray specifically. For example, there it says, God, give us this day. This day, that means with specificness. So God, give us this day our daily bread for this day specificness so when you're praying pray specifically you know many years ago i remember i was praying for funds and i said god i need money you know actually right here i think when i was at bible college one time i was going through some financial difficulties and then i prayed that god i needed money so i prayed that lord i need money i started to walk as i was walking down the streets then all of a sudden i looked on the ground in those days uh the uh loony you know the loony now the square uh uh, Looney, which is a, a coin, was paper at that time. I picked up $2 from the ground and I took it up and I stuck it in my pocket. And I said, God, I thought I prayed for money, not $2. And then the Lord said back to me, is uh, $2 money or what is it? I said, yeah, this is money. He says, yeah, you prayed for money, so I gave you money. Why? What was the problem? The problem was that I did not specify what I needed. So when you're praying, be specific. If you are a single woman, you're praying for a husband. Pray, God, give me a husband who will be, you know, this and that. And that. Be specific because God understands. He knows exactly. So don't just pray, oh, God, give me a man. Oh, you give you. Don't just grab anything that prays. Sorry about that. But, you know, be specific when you pray. So when you're praying, be specific. Remember, have a relationship. All right? First thing you have to do is have a relationship in God, with God, and secondly, begin to hallow his name where in your heart, and to let everything that you do be governed by the word of God, even your prayer. Sometimes uh, when we pray, most of the time we just uh, say things, but I'll tell you something. In the book of Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah chapter 1, the Bible there says that God is always watching over his word in order to perform his word. In other words, God is looking for his word so that he can perform what he has said because God has exalted his word above his name. So whatever God has promised, he will do what he promises. So even when you come to God, when you're praying his word, God is bound by his word. God is not a man that he can tell a lie. In fact, whatever you pray, that's why when you're praying, use scriptures, get the word of God. For example, maybe if you are sick in your body, don't just say, God, heal me, heal me, heal me. Of course, God will heal you. But you know what? Get the word that talks about that healing. For example, maybe Psalm 107 verse 20, where the Bible says that he sent his word and healed them from the destruction of the flesh. So what are you doing now? You are taking the word that God is watching to perform and you're saying the word to him. You're saying, God, you promised here that when we ask, you said you set us free, you heal us. Therefore, God is bound to do his word because he promised that he will do what he says he will do. God is not a man. He doesn't lie. So pray the word of God. Don't waste time just even... When it comes to uh, binding and loosening, sometimes when it comes to bind, when we pray, we come against Satan and stuff like the way people do it. Sometimes they kind of uh, play games. You know, I remember many years ago, we used to do a lot of that where we'll be sitting and then we say, uh, Satan, I command you to come here and I take the blood of Jesus and I pour it upon you and I send you to hell and I increase the temperature by 90 degrees, burn devil. And the devil is looking at you and says, what are you trying to do? Because, you know, and sometimes we used to insult the devil in prayers. You are wasting your time. Use the word of God. In fact, even the devil himself quotes the word. Remember when he came to Jesus to try and tempt him, he says, it is written. But a lot of people today, they don't know the word. Don't be lazy. Start to read the word of God. When you read the word of God, you're going to grow. And when you pray, to pray effectively, you need your prayers to be God. 
governed by the word of God and the word of God should be in there. Find the scripture that is contrary to what you're going through. For example, what I mean by that, if you're sick, you find the scripture that talks about healing. If you need finances, Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So you find the scriptures that are talking about your circumstances. You know, use that to pray to God. And so use the scriptures when you're praying that. Now, we were talking about being specific there. So be specific when you pray. Now, I love something here when you look at that verse that says, uh, give us this day. And then it says, and forgive us. So now, you cannot pray without forgiveness. And I know we waste our time, many of us, I've seen people, I've done that mo most of the time over the years where you were so mad about something about somebody and then you went to pray. It doesn't work that way. You need to have a forgiving heart. As, as we go on, you find that at the end of the Bible says, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you either. So you need to forgive in order for God to forgive you. If you do not forgive, then God won't forgive you. So now, it says, forgive us this day as, uh, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And now the word and is a conjunction, it's a connection. So then uh, give us this day and so it's connected there. It's connected. So you know what? For me, I say, we are to forgive as often as we eat. Wow. Give us this day and forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who our debtors in other words so forgive 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 now and i know i've heard quite a number of people that say you know it's very hard to forgive no it's not here's a here's a uh should i say here's a uh a secret should i say maybe a secret or a revelation or whatever you want to call it you know, if you start to pray for your enemies or the people that have hurt you, the people that you cannot forgive, it becomes easy for you to forgive them. And as you pray for them, God's just going to release you. You see that. But if you don't, it's like this, you know, unforgiveness is like me drinking. It's like, okay, let's say uh, me drinking poison right now. I, I, took, I took a cup, like this cup I have over here, and it's full of uh, cyanide or poison, whatever it is there. And then I'm drinking it, and I expect you to drop dead there, but I'm the one drinking poison. That's how unforgiveness is. You know, it's like me drinking poison and expect you to die. That's the wrong thing to do. So what it is, is unforgiveness, it hinders you to move forward. And God does not hear your prayer because now Isaiah 59, it says, uh, For the ears of the Lord are not so heavy that he cannot hear, nor his eyes so heavy that he cannot see. But your iniquity has hindered you, has separated you from God, that God cannot hear you because iniquity is standing between you and God. And therefore God cannot hear. Why? Because you have an iniquity in your heart especially unforgiveness. Now, iniquity, when we talk about iniquity, it's all kinds of stuff that people do. It could be fornication, adultery, whatever, all kinds of stuff that people do in their heart. And they harbor those things, and therefore they pray, but God does not listen. Why God is not listening? It's because it's not that God is deaf, that he can't hear, it's not that he cannot see, but because iniquity stands between you and God. And therefore, whatever you are doing, you're just wasting your time because get rid of iniquity. Again, it comes to relationship. Once that is clear then you have a clear way to talk to god you have connection with god remember that forgive 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 so forgiveness is something that we need to have no matter what people have done over the years there have been people that have hurt me and i of course i've done things to people too but you know what forgive forgive when you forgive you feel the release but if you don't forgive people it's like you're carrying them with you wherever you go you carry them on your shoulder imagine it's 20 people you haven't forgiven so you're carrying them wherever you go but meanwhile the person that you haven't forgiven they're over there they're free they're feeling better they're happy but you are carrying that burden and it's eating you up in fact there are a lot of psychosomatic diseases that they say today it's because as a result of things that uh, people harbor or unforgiveness of the way they're thinking because they're carrying all this stuff so release the people when you pray there's got to be forgiveness there remember that now in verse 13 the bible says and lead us not into temptation now does it mean then we don't 
we should pray that God should not uh, lead us into temptation. No, what we need here says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Every one of you is going to be tempted. If you are a Christian, if you don't have temptation, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> something is wrong there. Because as a Christian, you're going to be tempted. There's going to be moments where temptation is going to come your way. But you will pray for God to help you to, be, to deliver you from that so that you can. Sometimes God's going to make a way for you to go. And of course, it says there's no temptation that is greater than, but God always makes a way. Now, here's the thing. There's going to be some temptations that you don't have to rebuke. You have to run away from them. For example, one of them is Joseph. Remember, Joseph, when he was in Potiphar's house, when the wife of Potiphar was trying to get to entice Joseph, what did Joseph do? Joseph didn't stand there and say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. No, what he did, he ran away. There's going to be some things that you're going to have to run away. Some things you don't have to be uh, to try and rebuke them. Some things you run away, some things you rebuke. So you, you, you will find out which one uh, that is. Of course, God's going to give you the spirit of discernment and you're going to know when to do that and when and how and where. God's going to help you to do that. Remember that. But temptation is going to come. Now, may I say something? Temptation itself is a process that every believer would go through. Now, if you're being tempted, it doesn't mean you've sinned. Temptation becomes a sin when you succumb to the temptation and do exactly what you're required to do. Remember, Jesus was tempted. But just because Jesus was tempted, it didn't mean he, he sinned. He didn't sin. So temptation is not sin. Temptation is simply to be tantalized. That's what temptation is. It's like, you know, for example, if there's a candy up here on top here or somewhere, uh, there's a candy here. You know, you know, it's not yours or it's something you're trying to get it. You know, you are tempted to get it. The process of temptation is not a sin. But when you healed, when you take something without the permission of the owner, then you have sinned against God. And that's what God says that you, that's forbidden by God. Remember that. But you'll be tempted. And then the Bible says, you know, it says, deliver us from evil. God's going to be delivered. Pray every day for God to protect. Pray for protection as a child, child of God. Pray for your family. Pray for your children. Pray for different things. For people, even sometimes when I'm walking down the streets, you know, sometimes I see maybe a 747 passing over my head like this big airplane because I live closer to the airport. And every time I see it, and uh, you know what? I pray for the people in an airplane. You know, sometimes we kind of, oh, no, yeah, it's okay. They're just going there. But sometimes, especially if you are in and then you have turbulence, then you begin to think, you know what? If there's somebody praying for you there, it's going to be better. So I pray for them. Sometimes I pray for people. If I see an ambulance passing by, you know, so fast and an emergency vehicle just passes me by and goes so fast, I say, Lord, I pray for whatever is happening. I pray for those people. You know, pray, pray, pray. All right? Pray even for others. That's a good thing to do. And God is going to bless you. What you do for others, others will do for you. Remember that. Pray for protection. Pray for them. And that they have a safe flight or safe drive, whatever, wherever they are going. I pray for even people I don't know about. You know, I just pray for them. Even the persecuted Christians around the world today, I just pray for them that God will bless them. And then there, so the last verse, actually verse 13, it says, For thine, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Now, power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. I remember many years ago, we used to sing a lovely song that we says, Oh, power, power belongs to God. So power belongs to God. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. And then you say, Amen. Now, let's talk about the word Amen here. Over the years, I've seen a lot of people, especially in the charismatic churches there, or in the Pentecostals, if you want, or some of the evangelicals nowadays, they say amen. Now, the word people, when they say amen, some people, they use the word amen as a feeling in word. Uh, for example, I'll just try to make up something, okay? For example, they say, oh, our friends have come late to church today. Amen, amen. We are so happy today. Amen, amen. Somebody was hit by a car yesterday and they died. Amen, and then amen. Wait a minute. Amen is not a feeling word. Amen. When we say amen, what we're saying, we're affirming. For example, if you were praying and you prayed for something, for example, maybe somebody was sick and you pray, God, I pray that God, you heal this person. And at the end, you say amen. 
When you're saying amen, what you're saying, let it be so. It's a word of affirmation that what you've prayed should be so as you have prayed. So don't use the word amen as a filly-in word, especially as the charismatic in churches. Sometimes we just misuse that word. Anyhow, anyhow. No, no, no. It's not just a feeling word. So if somebody's praying, especially maybe maybe somebody prayed in tongues, you don't even understand what they said. You said, Amen. When you say Amen, that means you are agreeing with them to whatever they are saying. That's why we say Amen. And then the Bible finishes there. Jesus, as he was talking, he says something very profound, which I, w- I was talking about in just a moment ago. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, And then it says, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, vice versa, if you do not forgive them, then neither would your heavenly Father forgive. Do you want others to forgive? Then begin to start to forgive them. Now, so then, coming back to the question that we put as a title there, it says, so then why pray? We pray because we are communicating with God. We pray because we have fellowship with God. We pray because we have communion with God. Now, for to have an effective prayer, first of all, we're going to have, number one, have a relationship with God. Secondly, let our hearts begin to believe what God is, says He is. So we sanctify Him in our heart. And thirdly, let our hearts, let our hearts or let our prayers and everything that we do be governed by the Word of God. The Word of God should be the governing authority. Everything you do should be governed by the Word of God. All right? And believing and governed by the Word of God. And then They are the thing that to be effective prayer, get rid of sin, Isaiah 59. You know, for example, we talked about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is not the only sin. There's a a bunch of sins that people do. And by the way, there's no tonal gradation when it comes to sin, you know, because I know some people say, you know what, I think this is a big sin. This is a small sin. Now, it's like this. I'll try and give an example here. Today, if uh, one, let's say we have three people here, one, two, three. Okay, I'm having a little trouble with the battery. He's kind of going, I think it wasn't connected. Just give me a second here. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so if if you were, uh, if somebody stole, for example, if somebody stole, there's three people, one stole $100, and the other one stole a million dollars, and the other one stole maybe uh uh, a penny. All right. According to the worldly standard, the people say, you know, the one who stole the penny, maybe let me try to use a different example, trying to make it even more bigger. Let's say one stole a hundred dollars, one killed 20 people. All right. And the other one stole a penny. All right. So people would say eh, the one who stole a penny is just, uh, that's a little thing. You know, you don't even mind about it. It's just a penny that he stole. And then they'll say, the one who killed 20 people, that's a beat, that's a bad guy, that's a big sin. And the one who stole $100, I think it's not so bad. Why? Because according to human standard, we have tonal gradation when it comes to sin. We think that certain sin is so big and the small sin, and sin has standards. We think this is so big, this is so small, this can be forgiven, this cannot be forgiven. But guess what? When it comes to God, sin is sin. Whether you steal a penny, whether you kill 20 people, whether you steal $100, when God looks at you, you are all sinners. So there's no tonal gradation with sin. I thought I should just kind of throw that in there. Remember, sin is sin. Sin is sin. So shun sin. Okay, it's not big sin, small sin. Sin is sin. Shun away from sin to have an effective prayer life. And then... Maybe the last thing, remember forgiveness and remember also find a place. Prayer is a practical thing that you do. It's not just something that you say, oh, I pray or whatever. It's something that you have to do practical. Sometimes there are people from other religions that pray five times a day. But, you know, it's very hard to find Christians that really, really, really pray. You know, many of us here, we just pray when there's something, when we're in trouble, when things are not really going good, that's the time we pray. And that's why you see that for, for you to be praying, for you, for you to continue praying, you have to be in trouble all the time. But you know, for a child of God, whether trouble or not trouble, the difference is the same. We have to continuously stay in a relationship with God, already stayed connected all the time. That was, that's what we have to do. You don't have to wait for trouble in order for trouble to drive you on your knees. You can go on your knees without going through trouble and you commune with God all the time. Even when trouble comes, it finds you on your knees. We are to be praying people. Amen. 
I may God bless you. I'm Conrad Santo, living in a changing world with the changing people, with the changing times. I'm presenting the unchangeable Christ to the nations of the world. And I love you. For those of you that are there as we're concluding the broadcast, you are there. You don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. Remember, I was talking about the relationship. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior right now, I want you to pray with me. Or maybe if you have any question right now, feel free to do that. You can call that number right there and I'll be able to pick up the phone. I'll be able to talk and you'll be live on Glory TV. So, but let me just pray for the people that don't know Jesus. Wherever you are right now, you just pray with me. Just say, Dear Father, I come before you. I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my life. Set me free from all of my sins. I accept you, Christ, as the Lord and my Savior. Deliver me from the powers of darkness. And forgive all my sins and wash me in your precious blood because it's the blood that sets us free from sin in the name of Jesus Christ your son I believe in Jesus let him be the Lord of my life from today onwards as I surrender myself to you in the name of Jesus I pray Amen and amen. Now, if you pray that prayer and you're saying, Brother Conrad, I want to know more about God. Well, I can help you out. You can see that number there. You can see, you can find us on YouTube if you want. When you go to YouTube, you type in my name there. You'll find that uh, there'll be videos that will be coming in. You just speak whatever you want. And maybe if you want to call or you want to email us, just do that. Maybe wherever you are. But if you live in the city of Edmonton here, it's close by. Or if you're visiting, depending where you are, and you're coming to the city of Edmonton, we are in uh, Belgium area there at uh, 3831 the address is down there on the screen you can see the 3831 116th Avenue behind the Drake Hotel our services are Sunday morning at 10 30 and uh, Sunday at 6 30 in the evening and then on uh, uh, on uh, Tuesdays we do have a prayer uh, I mean the Bible study on Tuesday and it's including with prayer too sometimes so 1 p.m. and it's very interactive you know you'll be blessed when you come over there we talk about stuff and then if there's any question we answer them and people you have different opinions and people would contribute but we come back on the word of God that's what we use as a basis so please feel free to come over that's Tuesday for the Bible study it's very glorious time and uh, we are talking about attitude, attitude, attitude. That's what we're talking. In fact, there's a video on YouTube on attitude. You can go back to that and God's going to bless you. And again, so on uh, Fridays, there's a prayer meeting at 630. So we're inviting you. May God bless you as you come. And I just want to thank you so much, people, for watching. May God bless you and keep up the good work. Remember, pray, pray. I'll tell you 10 secrets as I'm going of... A successful Christian life if you want to have a successful Christian life 10 secrets number one pray number two pray number three pray four pray five pray six pray seven pray eight pray nine pray ten pray I just told you prayer prayer does a lot stay in communion with God I am Conrad Santa stay blessed and keep